At the beginning of March, I gave away two free weathering commissions when I hit 1,000 subscribers. You've already seen the runner-up prize, but now it's time for the main prize. Weathering a Rock Island SD40-2, coming up on JC's Rip Track. Hi there, my name's John and welcome to JC's Rip Track. If this is your first time here and you're looking for advice and tips on how to transform your plastic models into something that looks like it belongs on the rails today, click on subscribe and that little bell icon so you can be notified every time there's a new video. So what is your biggest challenge when it comes to weathering locomotives? Please let me know in the comments section down below. This is the second video stemming out of my 1000 subscriber giveaway draw back in March. The two prizes that I offered were a service rather than something physical. The idea was for the winners to send me one of their models. I would then weather it for them and then film the process for a future video. Three weeks ago, I released the video for a covered hopper that was the runner up prize. And now it's time to show you the main prize, a locomotive commission. Like the covered hopper, this locomotive started out bright red, but this would be a heavy weathering job as all of the prototype pictures showed a considerable amount of rust, grime, and soot. However, the way in which this red locomotive weathered was quite a bit different than the covered hopper. During the process, I posted progress shots and notes of both pieces on my new Patreon page, which you may have seen, but this video now shows the locomotive from start to finish. The model Florence sent me was an Intermountain SD40-2 in Rock Island colors, particularly the red-yellow scheme with a bold white letters down the side. These are well-detailed N-scale models. This Rock Island locomotive was numbered at 4796, but Florent indicated that he wanted a more of an amalgam featuring weathering patterns of several locomotives in the 4790 range. So it wasn't so much a replicating of a prototype, as I would be doing something in the style of a group of locomotives. Like the last start to finish video, this featured a red model. And as I said before, red is a difficult color to get right with weathering. Even though I was working on two red models concurrently, my tests indicated that I would be going in a much different direction than the covered hopper. As with my previous efforts, having a prototype photos handy was an absolute must. In preparing the model, the main thing was to remove the shell from the chassis in order to get better access to the detail, and also to protect the motor. Because of how the locomotive is built, I would be leaving the trucks attached to the chassis because to remove them would mean a near complete disassembly of the internals, which is not something that I wanted to do. Once I popped the shell off the chassis, I then removed the fuel tank and then worked on removing the top and bottom parts of the shell from each other. I did this by gently prying the railings away from where they attached to the upper shell using a small flat screwdriver. Given how the windows on this model were attached, I opted to use a masking fluid rather than removing the windows. They're pressure fit and I had to be really careful with them. Unlike other manufacturers that have the plastic removable, it was better to leave them on and mask them off. By now, you've noticed that I've used toilet paper rolls as a handle for working with N-scale locomotive shells. These are common, easily found in any household, and they're just the right size to provide that nice handle that I can put the locomotive on. If the roll becomes a little too flat, the shell can pop off, but all told, as a handle for airbrushing or weathering in general, this is an easy weathering and painting hack for all you end scalers out there. I handled the first fading step by doing a one-to-one -one mix of AK Interactive Satin Varnish and Off-White. This mix would set things up for the dot fade in the next step by providing a satin finish, but would also fade the colors. My choice for using the off-white is that it has a slightly greenish tinge to it, which as a contrasting color to the red, would desaturate the red without turning it pink. When using the AK Interactive Real Color paints, I had to make sure that I kept water out of the mix. These colors are really good, but they really do not like water, or at least they don't like the water around here. I may test them with distilled water at a later point.
To make sure I had even coverage, I decided to add a second coat of straight satin varnish to make sure that we were set up for the oil colors. For the dot fade technique, I used white, parchment, yellow, red, dark rust, and green oil paints, keeping the lighter dots to the top of the model and the darker ones more towards the recesses. Anything of a more orange-brown nature would also work well with both the red and yellow areas in the model. I used a little bit more white with this dot fade than I did the red covered hopper, and what yellow I did use was primarily for the yellow paint rather than on the red. I made sure to use some of the white oil paint right inside the white Rock Island lettering, which would help keep that color distinctive when I started blending everything together. I used the red oil paints in the middle section just around and below the logo, and the rust tones I used around the bottom of both the red and yellow areas. I would then let the model sit for a time 20 minutes before coming back and doing the blending step. When blending the dots in the locomotive, I like to start at the top, but instead of just smearing the dots, I worked out from the middle, trying to mimic the direction that water might flow off the model. I mentally split the model in half and worked the blending down one half of the top towards the outside, and then coming back and doing the same on the other side. On the sides, I used downward strokes evenly across the whole model. If I did need to scrub the model a bit to get the dots to disappear, I quickly followed it up with a final downward stroke to keep a vertical motion of the natural streaks that happen with this step. The key with dot fading is to make the dots just disappear. There may be a few places where too much pigment has accumulated on the brush and you'll need to wipe it off and clean it, but there's other times where that accumulation will play to your advantage. The main thing is, not too thick and there should be no visible dots of oil paint on the model. Once the dot fading had a chance to dry overnight, I then did a clear gloss acrylic wash, my usual standby of future thin with a bit of 91% alcohol. This preps it for the enamel washes that I would be doing next. The pin washes on this model were a two-step process, or more specifically, I would use two different enamel washes to achieve the look I was going for. I wanted to make sure that I was using the best color for the different parts of the locomotive. Since the nose and tail of the unit were yellow, I elected to use a brown wash for these areas, where the dark wash, while a much darker shade of brown, would be better to bring out the details in the red areas. Even though I was using two different enamel washes, the process is the same. Over a gloss coat, I would brush on a thin amount of odorless mineral spirits as a thinner, and then I would, with a small brush, take the wash in question and touch it to the details, allowing capillary action to help it flow around the details. I just made sure to use the brown wash on the yellow parts and the dark wash on the red. Once this had dried a bit, it was now time to work on softening and blending the wash to give it a very natural look. Smoothing with the wash was a combination of paper towel and dry flat brush. The main thing is to use these to soften the edges so there are no obvious tide marks or thick lines. The paper towel is good for getting the large parts of the excess wash off, while the paintbrush is more for blending after that. If you come in too early with a brush, you may find that too much pigment gets on the brush and then you're just smearing it around the model rather than blending or removing it. After doing a flat clear coat off camera, it was time to move on to some complicated chipping effects. The first step was to work on the fuel tank. The prototype photos show extreme chipping and rust on the tank, and while not the signature piece for this model, it was still very distinctive. I used Games Workshop Domstone, which is a light grey colour for the first step, simulating the drastic model fading of the grey paint on the fuel tank as seen in the prototype pictures. Using a sponge, 
I lightly dabbed this color over the fuel tank, keeping a picture of the prototype example handy as a guide. I would then do the exact same process using Mornfang Brown as the rust color. I paid close attention to the prototype picture, trying to match the patterns that were evident in the pictures. As rusty as it was, I kept the paint and the sponge light, slowly building up the layers where it looked good. The next step was to paint over the Rock Island logo on the front end of the locomotive. On the prototype, the front logo on these prototypes within this numerical range, the logos have either peeled off or have been painted over. Either way, the best way to simulate that was to try to match the patch. I used acrylic yellow paint, blending the colors that I had to match the prototype pictures. This required a small brush and a steady hand. I ended up doing two layers of paint for this, as the first was to cover up the logo, while the second would match the color of the prototype picture. The acrylic paints that I used were my standby of Games Workshop paints in a few different tones of yellow. I would then add a light cream or bone color called Screaming Skull to the yellow to get the right tone for the patch. For the major part of the chipping, I used the sponge technique in a few layers. I started with AK Interactive's acrylic chipping color and lightly sponged it across the model, focusing on the upper parts, the walkways, the grab irons, and the other handles. After the first pass with a darker color, I then did a second round using Mornfang Brown to make sure there was some pronounced rust, especially on the fuel tank. I then brought out the small sun visors to handle some of the chipping on these tiny pieces as well, just lightly sponging the colors as I went. The next step was starting in on the signature look for this piece, namely some serious staining and streaking down the left hand side of the locomotive over top of the Rock Island lettering. This would be the real step to determine if I could get a convincing facsimile of the prototype. The streak itself was specifically based on the pictures of the Rock Island 4792 rather than its stock number. There is a lot of heavy grime or soot streaking down the side. Using oils, especially Starship Filth, I worked on the sides, leaving much of the top for a later airbrush application. Using a small point brush, I applied oil across the top edge of the model and adding several dots or spots along the top edge of the panels that have streaking on them. I then used a dry flat brush to draw the streaks down. This would take a couple of applications, alternating between the dry flat brush and the small point brush to reapply more oils. And this would take a couple of layers going back and forth to get the look right. There were a few places where the streaks were so thick that they flowed down over the walkways and continued down onto the tank itself. I had to do this across all three separate components. The end result was a very heavy greasy stain down the left side, as well as a match stain, although not as strong, on the right. Using Tamiya Flat Clear, I did a quick clear coat on all the component parts before moving onto the soot and then the dust with the airbrush. The soot is a relatively straightforward process. I airbrushed Tamiya XF1 flat black across the top of the model, building it up to simulate the soot on top of the model, and then blending it into the oils that I had already streaked down the sides. I didn't need to put a lot of paint in the airbrush, and I slowly worked it across the top of the model. The main concentration were around the main stacks, but I also made sure to have the spray close to the edge, blending it in with the oil streaking step. The next part of the process would have me reassembling the model shell, which ended up taking longer and being trickier than I expected. The first step for painting the trucks was to lighten them slightly by airbrushing a mix of Tamiya, light sea grey and flat clear over the trucks. I used a cardboard mask made of some card that I had handy. 
Since I had left the trucks attached to the mechanism, I masked off the components and would then airbrush the gray color mix over the trucks to get a nice even coat. I was able to paint the trucks without touching the wheels or other electronic components. Once this was done, I needed to add a few rust chips to the trucks. As I did before, I used more frying brown and a sponge with most of it dabbed out to lightly chip the trucks. Using a trick from the new painting model trains from Ammo by MIG, I opted to use their engine grime enamel wash as a way to get a unique result on the gray colored trucks. This was a two-step process that involved airbrushing an enamel paint, something that I normally don't do because of my current lack of a spray booth. This involved holding my breath a lot and isn't ideal, but the results were worth it. I used the same mask as before to make sure that the wheel stayed clean. The next step in the process was to use a little bit of enamel thinner and a stiff bristled brush to lightly soften the airbrushed engine grime. The end result sort of looks like an uneven wash, but the thinner draws the grime color into the texture of the trucks and gives a nice realistic result. The last step was to reassemble the model and it is good to go. It gets to wait for her sisters to join her as the weathered veterans of the rails. In all, this locomotive took about four hours to bring from a clean model to this point. This locomotive was part of a free commission that was part of my 1,000 subscriber giveaway, but Florent has sent me two more locomotives that are receiving a similar heavy weathered look. Once all three locomotives are done, I will be adding a little bit more dust to this Rock Island locomotive, but for the moment, I am calling this done. I do hope you found this helpful. As with the covered hopper, I focused on getting the signature look. Whether it is a certain bit of chipping, a particular streak or wear pattern, or the unique dark grime streaks like this model, as I've said before, get the signature look right and everything else falls into place. So if you want more tips on how to get the most out of your weathering and painting projects, don't forget to hit subscribe and that little bell icon so you won't miss any upcoming videos. Also, if you haven't already, check out the other videos on this channel as well as some of the social media links down below. If you like seeing how Florence Commission went and you want a chance to see how one of your own might look, go check out my Patreon page and you can get involved in the creative process for this channel. So thanks so much for watching, good luck, and may you keep on track.